Episode 190 of the Read to Lead podcast is brought to you in part by Cloud Accounting Software FreshBooks with a free 30-day trial they're making available just for you. To find out more, go to freshbooks.com slash read to lead and enter read to lead in the How Did You Hear About Us section. with having success by luck or happenstance is that we think we've learned some immutable truth about how to do something when really we we stumbled upon it. Welcome to the Read to Lead podcast with Jeff Brown. Jeff believes that if you desire to achieve true success in business and in life, then consistent and intentional reading is a must. The Read to Lead podcast will not only help you narrow this ever important reading list, but also bring you key insights and valuable feedback from some of today's most successful and inspiring authors. And now here's Jeff. Hello and welcome to one of my favorite podcasts and what I hope is one of your favorites as well. It's the podcast dedicated to your personal and professional growth. Uh, we dig into leadership and also personal growth and topics like productivity, career, business marketing, sales, entrepreneurship, and quite a bit more. In just a moment, you and I will be joined by Constance Derricks. She's the author of High Stakes Leadership, Leading Through Crisis with Courage, Judgment, and Fortitude. And I'm going to be asking Constance to share her thoughts about the three key components of High Stakes Leaders, pragmatic ways we can gain valuable insights into the people that we're leading, CEOs who are themselves great examples of effective high stakes leaders, and plenty more. I want you to consider taking just a moment to try something that will not only help the podcast, but will also, and more importantly, help you, especially if you're a freelancer or maybe a solopreneur like me. You're leveraging the margins of life to to run or maybe launch a side business. You've got to have an easy-to-use cloud accounting solution. You've got to have some sort of accounting solution, and I think a cloud accounting solution like our sponsor, FreshBooks, is the perfect choice. If you've listened to the show for any amount of time, maybe you've heard me say that I've been using FreshBooks about eight years now and was thrilled when they came to me and wanted to help offset some of the costs associated with the podcast by sponsoring the show because it's a product I really believe in and, as I said, been using for a long, long time. And they've they've done their best to make it really a no-brainer for you to try it out. There's no obligation. There's no cost. There's no credit card information that has to change hands. All you have to do is go to FreshBooks dot com slash read to lead and you can try fresh books including having access to all of fresh books features for 30 days again it's absolutely free the web address to try it out freshbooks.com slash read to lead when you sign up be sure to enter read to lead in the how did you hear about us section and you're on your way again that website address is freshbooks.com slash read to lead i believe it's the perfect accounting solution for you and your business. Constance Derricks, PhD, specializes in working with organizations in high stakes situations, things like mergers, acquisitions, uh, CEO succession, strategic change, and crisis. You know, the easy stuff. Uh, she's, yeah. she's worked with a number of uh, names you'll recognize, businesses like AT&T and Belk, Boys and Girls Club of America, IBM and and Westinghouse, to name a few. And she's advised more than 500 executives on five continents in nearly 30 different industries. Her brand new book, the one we're going to dive into today, released just over a month ago, and it's called High Stakes Leadership, Leading Through Crisis with Courage, Judgment, and Fortitude. Constance, welcome to the Read to Lead podcast. I'm excited to have you. Oh, thank you, Jeff. I am thrilled to be here. Uh, Tell me a bit about where you're sitting right now. (laughs) <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, uh, I'm I'm actually um, on Fripp Island, which is an island off the coast of South Carolina. Uh, the closest uh, small town is Buford, which is a lovely bucolic place uh, made famous by Pat Conroy, mm. an author, as I'm sure you know. And I'm actually staring at the Atlantic Ocean right now. Nice. So. I can't. I if I complain about anything, I just need to be punished. Because <laughs> <laughs> this is pretty great. Well, you don't strike me as 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 a serial complainer, uh, from what I've read and then learned about you over the last few days. So, uh, let let's start off by by having you define more specifically, Constance, what you mean by high stakes leadership. These traits that you feel today's uh, successful leaders, you know, have in common. 
Yes, thank you. Um, so first of all, let me say that that I think things are high stakes when the risk is high and the visibility is low. So often I'm advising leaders on ma- major decisions that they can't get wrong. Mm. And over the years, I noticed I was I was always looking for what do these leaders who do very well have in common and what's missing when people stub their toe and trip and mm-hmm. stumble and hit their face on the curb. And so I came up with three things. And the first mm-hmm. is courage. Mm-hmm. The second is judgment. And the third is fortitude. And I played with these three ideas and how they relate to one another. And I would take one out and say, well, what happens if you have courage and judgment, but no fortitude? What, what does that look like? Um, and I concluded that these are useful categories uh, because people can learn about them and they can strengthen their ability in any of the three and hopefully in all three. So are you saying that then if a leader possesses, say, one or two of these attributes, they're, they're not going to be effective, in your opinion? They, they must have all three? They must have all three. Um, if you only have two or one, you might, be, you might have some success, but it will mm. be luck and happenstance. Unfortunately, when leaders are lucky, I mean, it's fun to be lucky. I, I'm not giving any of my luck back. You know, <laughs> the things that have happened to me by chance, I'm keeping those. <laughs> but, the, but the problem with having success by luck or happenstance is that human beings, because we like to believe the best about ourselves, we think we've learned some immutable truth about how to do something when really we, we stumbled upon it. Mm. And it's okay to stumble. But it's not okay to stumble, but then believe you've discovered a principle. And that's why a scientific method, I think, even in business is very useful, because you're always asking, could this have happened by random chance alone? And of course, the point of the book and and your experiences, having worked through these issues with hundreds, uh, literally hundreds of executives, is that if you're missing one or more of these traits, it's possible to turn that around. Yes. I really wanted to look at uh, leadership capabilities that Mm -hmm. are teachable and learnable and repeatable, because I don't think it's useful to talk about things that are either difficult to change or can't be changed. You can't change how tall you are. (laughs) So okay, we, there's some correlation between, <laughs> well, for me too, <laughs> um, you know, there's some correlation between height and uh, career success. Mm. Uh, but if you tell me that, a five foot four person, mm. I can't do anything about it. I can wear high heels, but that's about it. So uh, similarly for a lot of focus on personality traits, you know, introverts rule. Like, so what? <laughs> Like, what, what am I going to do? Say, oh, I'd like to become an introvert. I don't think so. But I can learn to be more courageous. I can sharpen my judgment and I can strengthen my fortitude. Mm. And so that's why I wanted to choose things that people really could do something about. Yeah, I, I tried the high heels for a while, but it just it wasn't, wasn't a good look for me personally. <laughs> they didn't look good on you? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> well, one, one phrase you use in part one uh, of the book on courage uh, caught my attention. Uh, what, is, what is courageous impatience? Oh, I love thinking about that. Courageous impatience is being willing to exert some emotional force in your organization if you're mm. a leader. So let me back up a minute and say that courage is emotional. In fact, the word courage comes from the Latin word cour, which is heart. Mm. And then it went into the French language from there. And so if you think about how we talk about this, we say to people, take heart, you know, or Mm. have a heart. And it's very emotional. And emotion gives energy. So information makes people think emotion is the fuel for behavior. Mm. So a courageously impatient leader brings energy that's constructive um, and to move something along more quickly or to sharpen a focus or, uh, in other words, to be dissatisfied with the status quo, not so much that you, you know, take away people's motivation, but to really fuel them and yourself. I find that, that leaders often don't like to admit that their decisions are often driven and, and born out of their emotions that many leaders struggle with that, don't they? Oh, they do. They they deny it. They get angry. 
Um, <laughs> one, one leader yelled at me one day. Mm. He literally, he stood up, leaned over, his face was all red, and he goes, our decisions are not emotional. He's <laughs> like, like screaming at me. And I stood there and I said, you mean like now? <laughs> like, <laughs> Um, now, <laughs> this this guy wasn't the person who hired me, so it was, it was a very calculated response on my part. <laughs> but we think that emotion is is fluffy, it's superfluous, mm. but emotion helps us do the things that make our lives most meaningful and pleasurable. I mean, what do people talk about? I want my work to have meaning. Mm. Well, what is meaning? Is that an intellectual process? Mm. No. And we've discovered in behavioral economics that people are not rational actors in their lives. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel Kahneman, <laughs> Amos Tversky, and Richard Thayer, who just won the Nobel Prize mm -hmm. in economics, for helping us see through their great research that emotion drives our decisions. And much of this is outside of our awareness. But thanks to them, they're showing us this in more detail. And we can study it and learn about it. And that doesn't mean we're going to wrestle it to the ground because we're not. Now, with, with uh, the second of the three attributes you reference, judgment, that, that, that's the one that forces leaders to test ideas using, using reason. Yes, exactly. Mm. And in order for judgment to work well, um, we have to be willing to be wrong. <laughs> or, or yeah, that's a tough one, right? Yeah, yeah. And we have to be willing to realize that, okay, when I made that decision, it was correct, but something has changed. The market has changed. My team has changed. Our supply chain has changed. And so I need to make a different decision now. So sometimes people make good judgments, but then they cling to it for dear life <laughs> and, and are not flexible enough to um, exercise good judgment. It's really an ongoing process. Well, as effective leaders, Constance, what are what are some pragmatic ways that that we can gain valuable insights into the people that that we're leading? You know, that's an age old question, mm -hmm. and Peter Drucker said that it's one of the most challenging things mm -hmm. to do is to make evaluations of people. So my tongue in cheek answer is, you call me, <laughs> <laughs> I will help you with that. Um, but other than that, the way to understand your people is to watch what they do. Mm -hmm. Leaders spend a lot of time reading what people write and listening to what they say, but they need to watch what they do. And what you want to watch for is when is a person really, really, really excited and involved in their work and the work they produce is really great. So I always want to know what is a person really great at, comma, that they love to do, comma, that is valuable to the company. Mm. So when you have those three things come together, you can help a person be in the right seat and allow them to exercise their talents and then to grow their capabilities. Um, I think there's too much focus spent on trying to understand every nook and cranny of people, mm -hmm. and we don't need to do that. I mean, executives aren't therapists, though some of them <laughs> love to psychoanalyze, and they'll say to me, they'll say, well, why is he doing that? And I say, I don't know, but it's not going to help us if we know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's look at what the person's doing. And, and you bring up a great, arguably age-old point. Uh, you can have great people on your team, but if they're not in the right seat uh, on the bus, yes. so to speak, then <laughs> you don't have the right team, basically. <laughs> exactly. And sometimes people are shown the door mm. when they should be shown a different seat. Right. And it takes it takes work, it, and it takes conversation with people. So, I mean. One way to think about this is know thy people and you don't know thy people by hiring a team of psychologists to come in and, and put people through two day long assessment centers and give you a lot of information that may be correct, but might not be useful. Mm. Let's focus on what's useful and meaningful and let the rest go. Well, words like uh, authenticity and transparency get tossed around a lot uh, in leadership circles. Uh, talk about your thoughts on vulnerability, uh, another uh, sometimes buzzword, but specifically the intersection of vulnerability and boundaries. Yes. So the word vul vulnerability has gotten tossed around a lot, and I've even heard executives say, well, what what is what am I supposed to do to show that I'm vulnerable? <laughs> it's like okay, well let's first of all let's not make it a thing. Okay, it's not a thing. <laughs> um, but the the best way to demonstrate uh, vulnerability is 
to show people that you're a learner. And this is what you and I were talking about earlier before you hit the record button, yeah. is this this ongoing learning, this curiosity um, compels us to not only acquire new information, but to let go of what we thought five minutes ago or last year. Mm. That is that is vulnerability. It's a concept of vulnerability that I think is useful in business. And if you do that in front of people, I say to leaders a lot, learn in front of people. Show them that you're learning because then you're modeling it. That's appropriate vulnerability. So inappropriate vulnerability, which can happen when people sort of jump on the business buzzword bandwagon and say, oh, I'm going to be vulnerable, is that they dis- they're they too disclosing. So I had a boss a few years ago that was um, very disclosing about personal things happening in his life. And mm. the rest of us were like, ew. <laughs> <laughs> You know, he would tell us these things and then, you know, three of us would go out to lunch and we'd say, God, I don't want to hear, you know, I don't want to hear this. Mm. So when people are overly disclosing, they have what I consider porous boundaries. Mm. They're not they're not appropriate in what they're sharing and they set up a distraction. Uh, They can be very high maintenance people. So you want to you want to have vulnerability to show people I'm willing to change my mind. I'm willing to be influenced by the facts. I'm willing to be persuaded. But what I'm not going to do is share information about myself that will distract us from what we're trying to do. And and that's where the boundary piece comes in. I love that part of the book in particular. And I've experienced working under leaders in the past who struck that balance really, really well. Uh, and, and, oh, you, and you know it, you know it when you see it. And it's, it's the kind of person that, you know, well, like now you find yourself talking about your years later and using an examples like this. Yeah, he'll kill me if he hears this. Because <laughs> he'll know who he is. <laughs> right. Well, uh, among today's uh, CEOs and leaders, who, who might you cite, Constance, uh, as, as being a good example of, of a high stakes type leader? Um, I am going to point to a person that your listeners probably don't know. Um, and his name is Patrick Brennan. Mm-hmm. Uh, Patrick is a vice president at Cox Automotive, which is a large company in the automotive industry. Mm-hmm. And the reason why uh, Patrick is a high stakes leader is because he has courage, judgment and fortitude, mm-hmm. as his results suggest. He also has what I call courageous patience. Now, we talked about courageous mm-hmm. impatience. He has courageous patience, which enables him to um really understand uh, a situation that he's entering as a leader before he takes action. Sometimes the leaders think it's their job to kick in the door with their gun drawn. <laughs> and that, that, that all that does is send people scurrying for the, you know, to hide under their desks. Mm. I think another high stakes leader that I uh, ha- admired uh, both from afar and up close was someone who's uh, retired now, but uh, Joe Lee, who was the chairman and CEO of the Darden Restaurant Company, a Fortune 500 company. He was one of the people I thought about as I developed these three aspects of leadership. Um, somebody who's in the news, I don't know. I, when you ask me that, I can think of bad examples. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> They're all around. <laughs> uh, R- Richard Smith at Equifax, for example, you know. Yeah. Um, mm. No courage, bad judgment, mm. and absolutely no fortitude. And he's not in the mm. job anymore right. and doesn't deserve to be, if I might editorialize there. <laughs> and who was the, uh, I think you even cite this example in the book, the BP executive who yeah. on that last oil spill was like, I want my life back and didn't really understand right. the gravity of the situation. Right, exactly. <laughs> and in fact, I was giving a speech about three weeks ago and I was talking about your brand as an executive. Mm. You know, you have your company's brand to protect and you have a brand. And I said, think about Tony Hayward, former CEO of BP. What is the most memorable thing he ever said? And the audience almost in unison shouted at me. I just want my life back. Mm. That's never going to go away. Bad judgment. Now, you know, the man was under tremendous stress and we might say, well, it's understandable. But as the CEO, you have to be prepared for that. You've got to have your sea legs up under you. (laughs) Certainly. Well, I've got a couple of questions, Constance, I want to ask you that that aren't directly related to the book. But before I do that, I I want to give you a chance to share with us anything else from the book you want to make sure that we that we know about. Well, I think that what I want the reader to take away is an understanding that leadership is multidimensional. It's not unidimensional. Mm -hmm. And like a lot of things in 
in psychology, we thought, for example, we thought intelligence at one time was this thing. Like, <laughs> this is intelligent. Your IQ is 135. You get a Mensa card. <laughs> you have 125 IQ. You get no card. You know, and so, and Carol, Carol Dweck, who's, uh, um, she's at Stanford or Berkeley mm. somewhere, wrote a wonderful book called Mindset, where she takes that apart. And so leadership, you know, it's not unidimensional. If you're vulnerable, it doesn't mean you're a good leader. If you're intelligent, it doesn't mean you're a good leader. That leadership has these dimensions and that leadership can be learned. It can be taught. It can be strengthened and it can be weakened. And so it's something to pay attention to all the time. Well said. Well, you mentioned Carol Dweck. I'd be curious to know what books you go back to again and again. What are those one or two titles that have had an impact on you and maybe even your career that uh, that you like to recommend others pick up? Well, Carol's work, uh, particularly Mindset, I read it when it first came out. It's not a new book, but your readers should definitely get <laughs> it and, and read it. And I picked it up. It was one of the books that was next to me when I was writing High Stakes Leadership. Another book that I love is Dan Pink's book, Drive. Now, I will, <laughs> in all fairness, anything Dan writes, I'm going to read. <laughs> you, I mean, you and me both. And, Yeah, exactly. And he was so kind to give me a glowing endorsement for my book um, because I was able to meet him in person a few years ago. And he's not only a great writer, but he's a whale of a nice guy. And he's he's very excellent at taking basic science research. And he and he's a research writer. So he goes and digs around in the research and then he puts it into language that is useful by anyone. Um, It's useful. It's somewhat entertaining and extremely meaningful. And then the third book, which is which is a dense, it's a dense read. And sometimes when I tell people to read it, they call me later and call me names, <laughs> uh, is Daniel Kahneman's book called Thinking Fast and Slow. Mm. Kahneman and his research partner, the, the late Amos Tversky, did the foundational research for the entire field of behavioral economics. I don't know where we would be. You know, maybe Richard Thayer would have figured it out without uh, Kahneman and Tversky. But it's very important because it explains why our cognition is so important in decision making. And he talks about system one and two. And, and so I say to leaders all the time now, you need a cognitive clutch. And mm-hmm. they look at me like, what? Is that you? You are using your automatic thinking and you need a more deliberate style because this is too serious. And they understand that. So I I distill Kahneman's work down into two sentences, which is completely unfair (laughs) to to Daniel. And Daniel Kahneman is the only psychologist to ever win the Nobel Prize in economics. Pretty influential guy. I think he's at Harvard. Mm. But and I've never I haven't met him yet. I'm trying. (laughs) You'll get there. He's terrific. Uh And, you know, I could go on and on. But um, those those are three things that I've read. I think the most pivotal thing career wise that I read was I used to be a stockbroker. But before I was a stockbroker, I sold computers and IBM entered the market and obliterated all all the non IBM business. I picked up a fortune magazine in a client's office Mm. and read about people that trade options. And I started exploring um, the brokerage business. And I ended up at Merrill Lynch because I needed a job that paid well. Mm. (laughs) So so that was a very pivotal, I don't even remember what issue it was, but there was a guy on the cover with a a full length fur coat standing in front of a car that I don't know, maybe it was a Bugatti or something. I didn't know what the car was, but you never know when something's going to, you're going to read something and it'll spark something in you and you pivot and as long as there's energy there and as long as it feels, you know, honest about yourself, go for it. Success Magazine for me has, has been one of my favorite uh, subscriptions. Yeah, that's a good one. Well, uh, let me ask your advice on public speaking. I know you do a fair amount, whether that's in your consulting or at various conferences and whatnot. I'd love to, to hear from you, your tips for helping us deliver uh, an impactful and, and memorable public talk. Several things. First of all, you have to be the master of your content. Mm. So you need to be an expert in what you're saying. It doesn't mean you have to do all the research and then, you know, do a TED talk. (laughs) I mean, I haven't done that. Uh, But you need to you need to really be have a command of your of your topic. Mm. The second is you need to be excited about your topic. If you stand up on a stage 
and tell people about all the research studies, but you're not enthusiastic, then, you know, go home because <laughs> that's boring. Mm. Uh, your audience is not going to be any more enthused than you are. And the third thing is that you have to be pragmatic. So, mm. you know, I may talk about Kahneman and Tversky and, and all of that stuff, but then I want to land a message on my audience like, you need a cognitive clutch. And mm. this is why, and this is what it looks like, and this is how you practice it. And so mm. they leave with something that they can do differently that day. Mm. And those those are three things that are extremely helpful. And there, there are others, but for me, those are the three important ones. Yeah, so oftentimes I end up in front of someone who feels like they have to tell you everything they know, <laughs> share all their expertise. <laughs> it's like a fire hose coming at you. And I think drilling yeah. down, like you said, is, is, is very important. You know, that brings up another point. Lose the PowerPoint. Lose the PowerPoint. You know, if you can't <laughs> stand up and talk about your topic without reading slides, <laughs> you have a problem. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, I know the book has been out just over a month now, I believe. What What's next for you? Is it too early to ask that question, to, to dig into what you and your team are looking ahead to? Um, actually, it, it's funny that you're asking me that. It's almost like you and I have met <laughs> before, <laughs> which we have not. I'm at the reason I'm at the beach is I'm working on my second book, mm. which is called "Breaking Up Is Hard to Do," and it is not a book about dating. <laughs> uh, but you might hear the Neil Sedaka song in your head <laughs> sure. now. Dumb duty, dude. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's about mergers, acquisitions, and divestitures, and it's written from the perspective of the psychological dynamics, the cognitive, the emotional, and the behavioral things that leaders do that make deals work or make them fall apart. Mm. And I've worked on a number of deals. My clients succeed 400% more often than the average. And when I realized that, by the way, someone made me do the math, which is the <laughs> only reason I have that number. When I realized the the successful deals I'd been involved in, it forced me to ask, well, why, what are leaders doing right that do this well? Mm. And what are, what are other people doing that create that enormous fail rate in, in M&A? So that's what I'm doing now. And I'm at the beach with my writing partner and colleague, Dr. Linda Henman. And so we are sitting in a dining room at a long table for about six hours every day <laughs> uh, writing. And, and we are having a great time. I know that it sounds a little dru like a drudge, but we're having a great time. <laughs> well, the book, again, is called High Stakes Leadership, Leading Through Crisis with Courage, Judgment, and Fortitude. And when you can hit the sweet spot of those three, which Constance helps you do, then, then you're going to knock it out of the park. Thank you so much for, for being our guest today and for giving of your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jeff. It was, it was really a joy to talk about with you. If you enjoyed what you heard today, maybe you want to dig in a little deeper into those links and resources and maybe some of the books that Constance and I talked about. You can find everything you need at readtoleadpodcast.com slash 190. That's the show notes page for episode 190. Thank you for considering giving Fresh Books a try. You can find out more about that free 30-day trial just for you as a listener to Read to Lead at freshbooks.com slash read to lead and enter read to lead in the how did you hear about us section. I want to give a shout out to Tom over at the Next Year Now podcast, a podcast that in his words is based on the belief that everyday purposeful habits and practices are vital for you to thrive at work and in life. And each and every week, he interviews some of the brightest and most successful people with expertise and topics you might be familiar with, having listened to this show for any length of time, like personal development, health and well-being, business productivity, creativity, and entrepreneurship. Think of Tom as your virtual coach and the Next Year Now podcast as your weekly practice session. Tom says, if you want to improve or overcome the overwhelm of everyday life, then this is the podcast for you. You can find out more about it at nextyearnowpodcast.com. Well, that's going to do it for this week. Thank you so much for listening. I look forward to seeing you next time for the next episode of the Read to Lead podcast. Thanks so much for listening to the Read to Lead podcast. As a subscriber, we challenge you to be more than just a passive listener. Become a vital member of the community. Visit us on the web at readtoleadpodcast.com. Until next time, remember, leaders read and readers lead. Oh, 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 oh,